For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Grebner Gaddis, and this is Rooted. Hello, and welcome back to another week of Rooted. This week we're digging into a witchy favorite with a similar vibe to our first episode, Datura, also known as Thorny Apple, The Devil's Trumpet, Hell's Bells, and Gypsum Weed. Datura refers to a few specific plants, but for today we'll just be speaking primarily about Sacred Datura, which is botanically known as Datura ridei, which is the most commonly used plant, and also my favorite. It's a member of the Solanaceae, or nightshade family, though a lot of folks assume that it's actually a member of the Convolvaceae, or morning glory family, since it looks like pretty much just a really big morning glory. These absolutely stunning perennials are native to much of the American Southwest and some parts of Africa, now having spread prolifically in dry, arid climates. They tend to grow as weeds, popping up pretty much anywhere they're allowed to. That said, they're easily spotted due to their lush, dark green foliage and striking, large, trumpet-shaped flowers marked with distinctive light purple lines running up the center of each of their five pointed petals. These flowers are on full-on display April through October and tend to be open from dusk until around mid-morning, closing up to survive the heat of the day, and then spreading wide open right after that. They have a vaguely sweet smell and thorny bright green seed pods, hence the name thorny apple. They have an average spread of about 3 feet by 3 feet, making them hard to miss wherever they are in the landscape. While extremely alluring, it's important to note that all parts of this plant are extremely toxic and can cause extreme discomfort and even death at a very low dose. For this reason, it's not recommended that you ingest this plant in any way unless you've been appropriately trained by someone from a culture where these plants were used as medicine. Most of the ailments that Datora was historically used to treat now have much safer cures, so aside from spiritual or cultural contexts, there really isn't a reason to ever do more than admire these beauties with your eyes. That being said, let's take a look at the ways these sacred blooms have been used across history and culture. Starting with the American Southwest, the Aztec, Zuni, and Chumash people turned to Datura to treat ailments in ceremonial rites of passage. From a medicine standpoint, Datura has been used to treat everything from aches and pains to a common cold. For aches and pains, Datura root was often used both as a poultice to help heal wounds and gashes, and even as a sedative for surgery and setting bones. It was effective at this due to the scopolamine it contains. We discussed this in more detail in our episode on henbane, but as a quick refresher, scopolamine is an atropine alkaloid that essentially blocks the signals in your brain that make you feel nauseous. Taken in higher doses, scopolamine makes you hallucinate, feel euphoric, relaxed, and in too high a dose can cause nausea, heart palpitations, convulsions, and even death. In Haiti, however, scopolamine didn't just result in death. It was often used to create the living dead. That's right, we're digging into the origins of zombies. Before they were marching in droves and munching on innocent people, or being stitched together in a lab, zombies were created as a form of corporal punishment reserved for the worst offenders in society. Now, just like a lot of the other cultures and religions we discuss, we don't have a ton of insights or historical context into the nuances of this practice due to colonization and religious persecution, but we do have detailed field notes from renowned ethnobotanist Wade Davis, who leveraged some previous research from Zora Neale Hurston's 1938 book, Tell My Horse, where she discussed the belief in zombies in Haiti, but wasn't able to obtain the powder or potion to prove once and for all that zombies were a real part of voodoo tradition. At the time, most folks outside of the voodoo tradition or hoodoo traditions believed that zombies were just hearsay or folklore, rather than a real practice. And, I mean, who could blame them? After all, 
The tradition of zombification was a well-kept secret, with only the most powerful priests being privy to the nitty-gritty details. In fact, it wasn't until the 1980s that folks started more realistically considering that this so-called zombification could be real. As more folks started to come forward to share their own experiences having survived the ordeal, with death certificates and details that lined up to prove their stories. Based on their stories, the experience of being zombified went as follows. One day, you would wake up feeling really sick, like the worst flu you have ever experienced, sweaty, disoriented, unable to move. From there, you would start to seize up, and while you couldn't move or speak, you could still hear, see, and feel everything. As your family wept at your bedside and said their final goodbyes, there was nothing you could do to show them you were still alive, your pulse slowing to a weak thud, your chest tightening, the whole world slows and fades. As things soften, you realize, you're being moved to the morgue. Suddenly, the world has decided that you're dead, and there is nothing you can do to stop it. Days later, you're being buried alive. As the nails are driven into your coffin, you accept that you'll never escape. Your fate is sealed, and surely you'll run out of oxygen soon. As you take what you think will be your last breath, suddenly, air hits your face. Someone has dug you up, and your body is being lifted from the earth. You realize there is a fate worse than death, and it's just become your reality. For years, you're drugged, held prisoner, and forced to do someone else's bidding. No one will save you or even look for you, since they all already think you're gone. While it may seem like a sinister form of sorcery, it's actually a little more complicated than that. In his studies with a prominent and well-respected priest, Davis was finally able to learn all about how zombies were made. The answer, he found, was in a small vial of dirt-like powder. The exact ingredients in the so-called zombie powder vary from practitioner to practitioner, but the active ingredients are always the same. Pufferfish, and a Torah. In the main formula Davis was taught, the practitioner mixed the powdered bones of a child he and Davis excavated, dried toad, the Torah, pufferfish, and a few other ingredients Davis doesn't mention. Once applied to the skin, this dust gets to work quickly, with the tetrodotoxin from the pufferfish paralyzing the body and decreasing the metabolism. If a patient survives the first few hours after the poisoning, they will slowly quote-unquote wake up, but not before surviving their time in a morgue and being buried alive because of the kind of trance the toxin puts them in, slowing the heart rate, breathing, and preventing the muscles from moving, making the victim look dead. Once dug up, it's hypothesized that the victims were given to Torah as a sort of paste, with the scopolamine essentially making the person being held as a zombie unable to think or move freely, keeping them in a trance and unable to run away in the sort of slack-jaw-like state Hollywood loves to depict zombies in. But the voodoo tradition isn't the only one using Datora. Back in the American Southwest, many indigenous traditions turn to the sacred plant to solve crimes and mark rites of passage. On the crime-solving front, the Torah root was given to those accused of robbery, as it was believed the true identity of the robber would be revealed upon their ingestion of it. As a rite of passage, boys between the ages of 8 and 12, depending on the source, were given a mixture of the root blended with water. The resulting hallucinations and physical discomfort were meant to guide them on their first steps to becoming a man, and outside of the American Southwest, Datura has spread prolifically as a powerful plant across a wide variety of practices, being held sacred in many traditions and practices as a way to protect, enchant, attract, and open the mind. When used for good, sacred Datura can help practitioners open their mind, attract good fortune, manifest prosperity, and protect those calling on its energy from harm, a powerful ally in the plant world for those using it respectfully. However, when not treated with respect, it can open the door to dark forces, misfortune, and fear. Unlike henbane that was typically associated with recreational hallucinations and delirium, 
Sacred Datura is typically reserved for more serious spell work. Despite its serious and sacred reputation, there are plenty of lookalikes, so it's not uncommon to find historical instances of folks ingesting this plant without realizing or being prepared for the delirium-inducing effects. For instance, it's said that the colonizers in Jamestown mistook the Jimson weed for Jimson weed from their area, and loaded up their lunch with a ton of the blooms, excited to feast on a familiar flavor of home, only to then have terrifying visions and an even worse stomach ache. While those folks may not have been the biggest fans, New Mexico resident and famed artist Georgia O'Keeffe loved this plant, with it making frequent appearances in some of her most famous pieces. Seeing it in the landscape, it's easy to see why she found it so enchanting. Between its lush greenery, alluring blooms, and powerful potion-making potential, it's easy to understand why Detora has garnered such a reputation in witchcraft and beyond as a botanical ally worth having in your garden and grimoire. Next time you see it, I hope your heart skips a beat when you remember its ties to life, death, and even the space between. That's all I've got for this week, but I'll be back next week with even more tall tales and true histories of the plants we all know and love. See you then. Until next time, be kind to yourselves, be kind to the earth, and just like a plant, drink your water. If you liked the show, please subscribe and consider leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Rooted.Pod. We're finally updating regularly on YouTube at Rooted.Podcast. And you can check out our website, RootedPod.com, for transcripts, updates, merch, and so much more. The show is written, produced, and hosted by me, I'm Grebner Gaddis, edited by Kat Friend of Friend Diagram, and our theme music was written and produced by Eric Kluxen. Rooted is a Henbane Media LLC production.